Last week, we kind of talked about the SAB 121 SEC rule that prohibited banks from custodying Bitcoin. We've seen the House pass a bill to repeal that rule and has sent it on to the Senate. There's some news there, as well as there's some other news, votes and legislation crypto wise going forward that is going to happen this week and several other news issues that are going on and happening this week. But I want to jump over to the charts, charts guys. Um, the last time we looked, we were writing about here, and I was saying that if it closed above this high, this uh, previous high, that it may be, actually it was this high, this 65.5 area, that it would be a, an extremely bullish thing to close above that. But you can kind of see, guys, we've been trending down in this, this uh, bull uh, flag. We had this, this flag pull here, and we've just been forming this, this flag afterwards in this descending channel. But you can kind of see that we've broken out of that channel. Now, it'll be interesting to see. We kind of broke out of this channel up here as well, and then we ended up it kind of ended up being a trap and we fell back down on news of the the Middle East tensions and everything like that. So can we hold above this line? So far, we've been doing pretty good. We fell yesterday. Uh, we, we fell just a bit below right here just for a quick second. And then we've we've tended to uh, break out above that. But yeah, we've we've definitely made so I was I was kind of talking in the last video about how we had a low, a lower low, a lower low, and same on the highs. We had a high, a lower high, a lower high, and now we are finally breaking out of that downward trend. So we've actually set a higher high since this last high, and it'll be interesting to see where the low is after this. And if there's a low, if we don't just continue, I mean, right now we're just kind of trending sideways to upwards. Um, right now, this morning, guys, we are actually looking really good. We're almost looking like we're going to break through that 68 level, 68,000 level, which we haven't seen. I mean, going clear back here to uh, April 12th, we haven't seen 68,000 since April 12th. So exciting times. Things are looking good in the charts for Bitcoin. Uh, I'm still kind of waiting to see, make sure that we don't fall back into this channel, but things are looking good. Now, I say whether we, we fall back into this channel, there's some news that I, I, I kind of want to look at and show you guys that kind of suggests that we may not ever fall back into that channel again, that we in fact are breaking out to the upside. So I am going to get into all of the news and show you kind of that information. Um, but before we do that, guys, please, as always, go over and help out Olive Branch Animal Sanctuary. These guys have a ton of animals and are super, super just small and, and uh, starting out, guys. So these guys could really use your help in in supporting these animals not only does it take a lot of work to keep up with this amount of animals i have five uh animals here i have uh, three dogs two cats and a rooster uh, but these guys have a whole lot more than i do and let me tell you it takes a lot of work not to mention financials like it takes a lot of money to to feed and care for animals uh, but but just the work alone is is insane. So go over and help these guys out if you can. I have all these links. This is their link tree, but I have their link to their Ven Venmo, their uh, PayPal, and then you can you can always go over to their Amazon and Chewy wish list 
send them something that they need off that. But guys, I was, I actually saw a post from these guys, a, a Facebook post from these guys the other day, and they were talking about how grateful they were because they had received their first PayPal donation. Not their first PayPal donation this month, not their first PayPal donation from my efforts by any means, but their first PayPal donation ever. <laughs> so guys, these guys are super grateful for anything that they, that you can possibly donate to them. Go over and, and throw them a few dollars if you can. Honestly, these guys are so appreciative. They're so small that anything really helps and they're registered for 501c nonprofit. So anything you guys can donate to them is a tax write-off for you as well. So please, please, please consider going over and helping them out. Even if you just go over to their Facebook and hit this like button, that helps them out even as much, you know, honestly. So go over, help them out. Now let's get into the news. So uh, I believe this was Thursday that the Senate... The Senate got the bill passed through the House onto them, uh, repealing this SAB 121 rule, which prevents banks from custodying Bitcoin. Now, why this matters to you and I, uh, possibly, is if you remember back probably several weeks ago, I did a video on how you could collateralize your Bitcoin or your digital assets and take loans against those assets. And this was a way that you could possibly live off of your Bitcoin without ever having to sell it. Now, there are ways that you can do this on the internet right now through DeFi and other things, but this would open up that whole sector of banking as a way to collateralize your assets uh, for loans against those. So this is what this whole bill is about. The SEC does not want banks to be able to do that. Um, effectively affecting you if, if that is one way that you want to deduce things. But the Senate passed this uh, with the, the House passed it and then the Senate passed it. Now, Biden has uh, came out and wrote a letter saying that he was going to veto this if it did in fact reach his desk, which is now the case. Like the Senate has passed this and now it is heading to President Biden's desk. Now, whether he chooses to actually veto it or not is yet to be seen. Usually when, when both the House and the Senate pass something, it's extremely unpopular for a president to go against everyone's wishes and veto the bill completely afterwards. So not a popular thing to do, especially during an inner uh, and an election year. And on top of that, guys, this all this is is an accounting rule. So why the Biden administration would would take issue with an accounting rule um, during an election year. I just, I don't know. I don't know if he actually walks the walk here and, and vetoes this, but it, it, if he does, it's not going to be a popular thing from him. You know, even, even House and, and Senate Democrats voted for this bill that'll repeal this, this rule. So, for Biden to come out against it and actually veto it after all will be pretty, pretty unpopular. So we'll have to watch for what he does as far as that. Now, there is another piece of legislation, guys. It's called the Bit 21 Act. Now, this is going to be up for a vote in the House this week, and this one will be a little more interesting, actually, if I'm completely, you know, in my opinion. Now, what Bit21 does is this uh, 
Bit 21 seeks to delineate the regulatory responsibilities of the SEC and the CFTC. The act aims to clarify the jurisdictional boundaries between these two regulatory bodies. So guys, one big problem that we've had in the digital asset space has been the CFTC coming out and saying that either Bitcoin or Ethereum or who, whatever uh, digital asset is a commodity. And then we have the SEC that comes in at the same time and says, oh, no, no, that's our jurisdiction. It's a security. So we have all this confusion in, in cryptocurrency about how people and, and coins and agencies are supposed to act because they don't know who they're supposed to be, you know, <laughs> trying to appease or, or what rules they're supposed to be aiming for, basically. So there's just a bunch of confusion around digital assets right now, and it's stifling innovation. So what this uh, Fit21 bill would seek to do is kind of clarify all of that for the industry. Now, whether this passes or not is highly debatable. A lot of people are saying that the House will probably pass it and then it'll get to the Senate and they will bury it. So who knows? But if this does get passed, it would um, quite possibly give the industry some, some of that clarity that they've been asking for. You know, Coinbase and Kraken and all these these industry companies have been asking for clarity because they don't know, they don't, basically, they don't know which master they're supposed to be serving. Are they supposed to be serving the CFTC or are they supposed to be see, serving Gary Gensler and the SEC? Uh, so not only that, but it, it would probably give a lot more power to the CFTC um, and kind of take that, that power away from Gary Gensler and the SEC who have been ruling with an iron fist um, through enforcement, basically. So it's hopeful, guys. This, this act is kind of hopeful that maybe we'll get some, some crypto-friendly uh, regulation, or, or at very least, we'll get some clarity and know exactly what we're supposed to do or what these companies are supposed to be doing. So... That is up for vote in the House this week. Now, another thing that's happening again this week is ETF uh, deadlines for the Ethereum spot ETFs. So if you can, let's just move this over a bit so you can actually see. But we've got Van Eck that will, they are the first ETF uh, that is up for deadline, and that will be do this Friday. So the SEC will have to approve or deny at least the Vanek spot Ethereum uh, ETF this Friday. Now, um, we've got that Friday. I believe that's Friday. Let's just, or is that Wednesday? That is, Thursday. <laughs> Sorry, my my dates are all mixed up in my head. So 523 Vanek Ethereum ETF will be will have to be ruled on by the SEC by Thursday. Then we've got ARC21 shares that is due on Friday. Then we've got Hashdex and Grayscale that will be coming in next week. So a lot of Ethereum ETF deadlines coming up. Should be interesting to see what Gary Gensler and the SEC do. I personally, I, I, you know, several months ago, well, a few months ago, I kind of made that video where I was saying that it was hopeful that the SEC approved these because all of the, all of the uh, instances are kind of the same with uh, respect to the Bitcoin ETFs. You know, we've got futures ETFs already out there. 
So if they deny these spot ETFs, they're probably in for a legal battle. So I was saying that, you know, we've seen the SEC has kind of had their legs and arms cut off in the courts, and it's likely that we do see these approved. However, now with some of the enforcement enforcement actions that the SEC has brought recently, I just don't think the fight is out of the SEC yet. I'm not sure if we see this happening. However, you never know uh, with with the with Congress finally coming forward and repealing, voting to repeal this SEC um, rule, crypto rule, we may see Gary Gensler feeling some pressure on that side of things and may, may surprise everybody and actually approve these things. So who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe Gary you know, kind of, kind of finally fills that pressure and says, whoa, I've been, maybe I've been double crossed here by Elizabeth Warren, who put me in here and is now setting me up for a bunch of failures. So I don't know, it'll be interesting, but we've got that coming up this week. So be interesting to watch Thursday and Friday, what Bitcoin and, and Ethereum do as, um, as these decisions come out. Now, I was saying when we were looking at the um, charts, well, first of all, here's some news that just broke this morning. Grayscale CEO Michael Sonnenschein steps down and a Goldman exec is to take his place. So guys, if you don't know Grayscale is the trust that converted to an ETF in January with the rest of the approvals, and they've kept their rates so high that they've just consistently been bleeding out uh, with respect to assets under management. And so this is just kind of interesting news that Michael Sonnenschein is stepping down. Um, I don't know what really to take from this news, if it's just him kind of moving on or, you know, what, what the deal is with this. But guys, if we look at last week's ETF inflows and outflows, we actually saw the last two days of last week, we saw massive inflows from Grayscale specifically. Now, right here, this is just Friday, but you can see Grayscale Bitcoin down here at the bottom, we had 472 Bitcoin brought into Grayscale's Bitcoin ETF on Friday. And Thursday was just about the same. I think it was four, 450 or, or right, right there close. So big inflows, guys. We have not seen this big of an inflow into Grayscale since they came into uh ETF existence in January. So very interesting. It seems that the grayscale bleed has kind of stopped and they're actually having inflows. Now, what we've seen with the 13F um, filings from companies who have had to report these Bitcoin ETFs on their books just recently is a lot of the institutions that are buying these ETFs they aren't just buying one. So a lot of a lot of companies and institutions are buying BlackRock and Fidelity and ARK and Grayscale, or they're just buying all of them throughout the whole board. So for for institutions, it doesn't really matter these these uh, fees that the ETFs are charging seemingly don't really matter to institutions. It's if if they want to diversify against several of them, they're going to do that despite the fees. So if, if a company or an institution is, is comfortable with Grayscale as a company, that's who they're going to go for. It's, it has nothing to do with these fees anymore. We've seen the people who were in 
Grayscale as a trust before the ETFs, they've all seemingly gotten out of Grayscale and probably migrated elsewhere. And now we're finally seeing a, a point where Grayscale is having inflows where people are actually deciding they don't care about the fees, they're comfortable with Grayscale, so they're going to invest with their ETF. So very positive news for them. Um, and we've just seen everybody in, in the Bitcoin ETF just kind of having inflows this last week, which may signal that this next wave of institutional buying is starting to happen, guys. So interesting to watch. Uh, we'll have to watch what they do this week. But these are big numbers, guys. And from most of them, the only ones that didn't really have anything significant to report were Franklin, uh, Franklin and Wisdom Tree Bitcoin ETFs. So all of the rest are having pretty massive inflows. Um, now, another thing to look at, guys, is since the halving, we have 30, uh, 3,150 Bitcoin mined every week. Now, a month or two ago, before the halving, we were mining 6,300. So we've got that supply that's come down in half, but look at what the ETFs, this is just Wall Street. This is what Wall Street bought last week compared to what is being mined. So you can see right there, we have this supply shock coming down, but the, the demand shock from Wall Street is just massive. Even before the halving, this demand is outpacing the new Bitcoin that's coming in to existence. So very, very bullish here. This is why I kind of say that I doubt that we're going back into that downward channel is because this appetite from from Wall Street is just swallowing up everything. They're swallowing up, I mean, what is this? Four or five times? Almost five times what is being the supply. <laughs> so yeah, we have Wall Street almost doing five times what the supply actually is, which is just going to send the price through the roof. Okay, so in other news, um, you know, we've we've always kind of covered on this channel the the Middle East, the tensions in the Middle East. But guys, just last night we had this news that the Iranian president was killed in a helicopter crash, which is suspicious to me. But I guess they're going to have. Um, they're going to have elections and elect a new president. But this is just more instability when it comes to, to the whole situation in, in the Middle East. And we've seen that um, in, in Israel as well. We have a member of Israel's war cabinet says he'll quit if there is no plan to replace Hamas in Palestine. So we have internal fighting in Israel. Uh, we've got the Iranian president just suddenly dying. Um, the ICC, the International Crime Court, criminal court, um, are seeking to get arrest warrants for Israeli President Netanyahu. Now they're going after is Israel and Hamas for cri uh, war crimes. But nobody really cares that they're going after after Hamas. Um, they're they're more up in arms about this warrant against Israeli President Netanyahu. Um, now I say they don't care. Obviously, we care. We want Hamas to be held responsible for those uh, October seventh attacks on Israel. But we've seen this response from Israel, there's been uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, guys, is what 
Netanyahu is being charged with. He's being charged with killing civilians uh, without prejudice and uh, causing a situation where civilians are being starved to death. So he is absolutely, <laughs> in my opinion, um, guilty of war crimes. Now, the, the U.S., the interesting thing is that the U.S., um, the Biden administration has come forward and says that the ICC, the, the International Crime Court, has no jurisdiction over Netanyahu. And I can't, I can't fathom where they're getting that because if the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction over war crimes, then who does? I, I just don't understand where the Biden administration's coming with that. But we also have, guys, we have also have GOP conserv conservatives threatening the ICC with sanctions if they if they seek Netanyahu's arrest. Now, ironically, um, you know, the whole thing in the Middle Middle East, all of this war that's going on is obviously um, part of macro that that affects Bitcoin and pretty much all markets. So that's why we've been kind of covering it here on this channel. But with GOP conservatives threatening to sanction the ICC over over this arrest warrant for Netanyahu, just kind of furthers that discussion into crypto and and the dollar essentially as a whole, because this is why BRICS, these nations are trying to de-dollarize because the U.S. has weaponized the dollar and it's always our last line of coercion. It's our last thing that we pull out and we threaten people with if they don't do what we want them to do. And so, you know, not only um, nations like BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, South Africa, Iran is in BRICS now. So not only are these companies or these, these countries being um, sanctioned and they're sick of it, they're, they're finally deciding we're done with this. We're going to go off your dollar. But we have I see the International Criminal Court that is is being threatened now with sanctions of the dollar. And it's like, I don't know, these these politicians, they just don't even I don't know if they they've got to understand that what they're doing is going to hurt the dollar as eventually in the future. Um, but it's just like it's almost like this knee-jerk reaction from our politicians to to weaponize the dollar and pull it out as a threat you know if you don't do what we say we're gonna slap you with this dollar sanction thing and <laughs> i don't know guys it's it's out of control um our politicians are absolutely out of control with using the dollar as a weapon and what it's going to do to the dollar is not going to be good for anyone here in the U.S., but they just can't seem to help themselves. So anyways, guys, I am actually working on another video. Um, I, I mentioned when I was talking about that SAB 21 rule where the SEC is preventing banks from letting people collateralize um, and use the banks to collateralize their Bitcoin. I kind of did a way that you could kind of retire and not have to sell your Bitcoin that way. But I'm actually working on another video to kind of show you guys another plan on how you can retire on your Bitcoin uh, without collateralizing Bitcoin. So um, I know the collateralization and taking loans against your Bitcoin, for some people, they don't want to do that because uh, they want to keep self-custody. They don't want to have to hand their Bitcoin over to banks or put it into a smart contract or whatever. And to some, it's it's just too risky to even, you know, take loans against and, and use uh, loans to live on. So 
there is some other ways that you can retire on Bitcoin. And there's one way in, in specific that uh, is often ta taught by economists and financial advisors as a way to retire on your assets. So I'm working on that video right now. If you guys could please hit that like and subscribe button. Um, you know, it's, it's always good to see you guys that like my videos. Sometimes I see, you know, hundreds of people watching my videos and only two or three people have, have liked it. I don't really care about the algorithm if I'm totally honest, but I do like to know when you guys are enjoying my content. Helps me to know what you guys want to, to see from my channel. So if you like this video, please like, subscribe, share, hit the bell notification, and let me know what you like about my videos in the comments. You know, sometimes that's all I need to know in the comments too. Let me know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to see more of. So that helps me um, kind of decide which way I need to take my channel to, to help you guys out the best. So anyways, guys, let me know in the comments. Uh, hit that like button and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.